Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are delighted that you've chosen to join us today. We are excited about continuing our study of Ephesians, particularly Lesson 7. And that's halfway through the quarter. Yes, indeed. There's 14 lessons this quarter because of how the Sabbaths fall in the months. Because, of course, fourth quarter starts in October. In any case, here we are, Lesson 7, The Unified Body of Christ. Let's begin with prayer. Father, this morning as we come before you, we are so thankful that you have promised to send your Spirit. We know that through the Spirit we can be the unified body of Christ. And, And so as we study, we ask you to impress upon our minds that which we need to take to heart. For we pray in your name. Amen. Memory verse halfway point of Ephesians. So we're in um, Ephesians. If you haven't been reading ahead, um, you know, there's only six chapters of Ephesians, so it's not like it's going to be... It's not really halfway, I guess, but it's past six, one, two, three, so I guess it is. We are looking at a specific part of, and today we get to see different people enunciated in this, um, through the, the memory text. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at what does it mean to be unified and how do we become unified. And so um, the memory text. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And that's 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12. Now, what's interesting to me is, as I read this, I thought, the shepherds... So... No, no, the shepherds... <laughs> I, I was thinking, back to Christ's birth, the shepherds. Who is he equating with the shepherd? Who are the shepherds? And then I realized it was pastors. Well, she, because she's not looking at the version, the English Standard Version puts that as pastors, pastors as shepherds. Other, other versions put pastors, of course, in the Amplified yeah. Version. <laughs> which gives all those lovely things. Um, uh, Verse 11 talks about Mm -hmm. the apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, Mm -hmm. and some pastors, shepherds of his flock and teachers. We'll look a bit more at those individuals who are, those gifts rather, that are given. to the church because this whole lesson deals with the the, the goal that God has for yeah. his church here on earth to be parts of uh, each individual has a part to play within the church to unify in the body of Christ. So if we look at all those different body parts, you know, is one more important than the other? And, you know, I, I um, they do the story of the feet and the stomach, the Aesop. You know, who's Which is important. one of the few without a quote-unquote moral well, at okay. the end of the story. Yeah, the, he didn't write it out because he figured it was pretty obvious. But as you look at this particular idea of the body, um, I have a, a play that I do with students, and it's the hand. And can the hand work? Which finger is more important? Which one can't we do without? And, and we know that in our world there are plenty of people that don't even have hands and they can function just fine. So as we go through this lesson, let's think about not what part of the body, but think about having it work together. Um, we only have to have, say, our ankle twisted or, you know, well, you have just been... just stub your toe. Yeah. I mean, it can be very minor. Yes, and it can impair, you know, activity oh, for a it, while. It reminds me of the line from from uh, Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol, where Scrooge first sees Marley's ghost, and Marley asks him if he could believe. He says, well, it, it, you could just be an undigested part of beef. You know, the senses are so easily perturbed. It doesn't take much, a very small thing out of out of harmony in the body and there are problems in the physical body there are problems just as yeah the lack of harmony in the church and can cause dr problems. McFay brings out the idea that it's the healthy unified body 
that we need to look at. So as we begin this lesson and we begin to look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Which is the entire chapter. It's, no, it's the beginning oh no, of chapter true. 4. Oh, no, that's true. It goes into the There's 20s. another half, which is next. It goes into, into the 20s. Yeah. That's correct. But the unity of the church. And I'm going to begin um, and just go through the very first go to part. Go the 30s. My, 32. Yes. So we literally, are doing, we literally are doing the first half of the of chapter 4, yeah. 1 to 16, because it ends in 32. Yeah. I, therefore, prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all lowliness and meekness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So, um, we're gonna, I'm going to stop there right now because I want to go back and um, look at the idea of um, to lead a life worthy of your calling to which you have been called. The English versions, the English Standard Version that Dr. McVeigh uses throughout, his, his, throughout this quarter's lessons says to walk in the manner worthy of the calling of which you've been called. And he emphasizes the verb work. Um, but that's a little bit ahead of where the lesson goes. Let's start out by talking about the seven ones. Yes. And how that's so important, having unity in the spirit because of those seven ones. And then in the second part that Tracy will continue reading, I'm sure, in verses 7 to 16, Paul identifies who, uh, um, who those victorious persons are, who uh, G- the exalted Jesus um, led shine, the shining gospel and describes how those church members contribute to the health and the growth and the unity of the body of, of Christ. Yeah. So often we equate being called with looking at the gifts that he's given us. And that's not what it is. It's called to... To be a Christian, to be Christ-like. To be a part of the Christian faith. That's what we're all called to do. That's where the unity comes in. We're called to be a part of the church. And remember, yes. the church is not a building. Yes. It's a group of people, probably as small as two, who are called to Christianity by the Holy Spirit, by yes. God speaking to their heart. So that unifying behavior that reflects God's ultimate plans so what are those? As we look at it, um, and we look at that, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, the next virtues. part of the lesson breaks those apart in ways that, to me, at least for gentleness, was, what? I never thought about it like that before. You know, gentle, you usually think of, of treating something with great care and delicacy. If you're, if you're being gentle with a small animal, you, you caress it very gently. If you're being gentle with a small child, you cradle it and protect it. But let's start with humility. Okay. The word humility, this also kind of was, was expanded more upon what I thought about humility too. Do you have some notes you want to share? Well, there? no, I okay, want good. to share the so she... Bible verse. No, the Bible verse <laughs> that it refers. I, I know. Um, so we're going to read one to three. Philippians two ah, three. Philippians two. All right, Philippians two three. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being full in one accord. And when I read that the first time, I thought, oh. Um, if I look at this, don't be overly impressed with this sense. Well, humi- oh no, hum- to count others more significant. Humility is is, is 
to not make too much of yourself. Like it says here, it's a positive appreciation in serving others. See, that's the part that I hadn't gotten before. Humility is the, where she had uh, the lowliness of spirit. Humility, counting others more significant than yourself. But then it goes on, Colossians 2, 18 and 23. It's a positive virtue where you, uh, you appreciate and serve others. And that, you know, that's part of, of our communion service, the foot washing service, the, the service of humility, well, being, serving others. Yes, that being willing. And today, you know, most people don't come with dirty feet. <laughs> um, but when we look at that idea of, of serving others and doing that, you know, um, a number of years, well, it's probably been 15 uh, or more, um, we were in Hollister, and, and one of the um, community... 20 okay, here. 20. It goes by so fast. Anyway, um, one of the um, motorcycle ministries, I know that sounds funny, um, had come to Hollister, <laughs> which was a big motorcycle. Oh, Sunriders? Yes. And, um, S-O-N. One of the pastors was a Vietnam vet, and um, he said, you know, he gave some of his testimony, and it was... It was very, um, very humbling to listen to him because the humility he had for serving. Um, there was one man who was uh, kind of disrobing, and each time he'd bow to the wall of uh, his buddies who had died, and he had found their names on well, the wall, what the traveling left, wall. What she left out was there's a replica, I don't know the scale, but a replica of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. That travels. they have made a replica of it in a smaller smaller scale and then it, it at that point in time was traveling around the country and it stopped in Hollister during that was it Labor Day? Fourth of July. Fourth of July rally and this veteran, veteran found the name of his former army buddies for lack of a better word the men in his unit or company or whatever it was probably yeah. a unit and was in such grief he started taking off his jacket and his shirt and Tracy's here by herself at the wall, and <laughs> fortunately, Corky came along and, and helped. helped out. But and so. he, you know, he finally quietly talked to the guy, stood kind of back and to the side, and then the guy kind of, you know, oh yeah, and <laughs> um, you know, I I'm sure that he had been reliving um, the day uh, that they died on the wall. They put them in order of death. And um, oh, by no, year, by that's year. true. By year, not no. not by time and day, but well, by but year. Time, no, it's time and day too. Oh, and wow. in the squad, it's it. by okay. yeah. Wow, but it's it's a very moving thing. And I watched Corky work with this guy who obviously had serious PTSD. And Corky was um, the, the pastor of of the of the chaplain, motorcycle or call it, of, the of the group motorcycle group Sunriders. And he just quietly talked to the man. And when the guy kind of st- stepped back, and they had bales of hay kind of strewn about the Hollister. Anyway, hey, um, for them to just sit on and, and reflect. And um, Corky just sat on the ground off to the side of him and quietly spoke with him. I don't know what he said, but it was so impressive because I thought, that's true humility. You know, the guy probably would have listened because Corky was a higher um, rank. position, rank, than he would have been. But um, it was it was in humility that Corky served. And I watched him over the whole week. And no matter who it was, he reflected that humility of Christ. And... I was so moved by it. I will never forget watching him serve. And I tend to be a Peter, you know, who's like charging in. And Don't give her a sword. It was, it was a, a lesson to me about how effective you can be as a humble servant. And that is the, the walk that Paul is talking about, yeah. the behavior of Christ. Live as... Well, because he could have spoken and the whole thing would have fallen apart. (laughs) But he lived that humility, that willingness to put others. And I, 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 just that idea, more significant 
more significant than than himself. The next characteristic, if you're ready to move on, I am. gentleness, um, the quality of not being overly impressed with uh, by a scene of one's importance, mm-hmm. courtesy, considerative, considerate. Considerativeness. Considerativeness. Boy, there's a good word for you. Considerativeness. And again, meekness is what gentle it means in the, how it's used there in the Greek. Amazing. Those characteristics, gentleness, courtesy, and considerativeness. Being being considerate of, thinking of others, considering others before you. Today, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, so many people want to have respect that becomes a thing well they disrespected me you know so you know (laughs) my um my family was very good for someone who um got over being concerned about what other people thought about me um the idea that I need to think about get rid of self-importance. You know, I I probably my harshest critic, but to show courtesy and consideration to people who do not treat me that way. Um, one of the things my students, you know, every year we try to have the kids step up and teach a class. And over and over, they'll say, I don't know how you can stand the disrespect. And I said, it isn't about disrespect. They're teenagers, and I don't take it personally. And there's one thing, too. We know from years of research that, and I'm going to say it's because of sin, but the fact that the human creature is very what we call idiosyncristic, (laughs) egocentristic, for the first 18 plus years of life. It's all about me. It's well, all about they kind of get to us. Well, but you know. But I'm the most important of us. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> it only as true maturity takes place is are you able to look outside of that and perhaps. And get to you. Be gentle. Yeah. Truly gentle. You know, yeah. I, I think in running an empty classroom, I'm so concerned with what I need to help the kids need. Uh, what I need to do my job to give them what they need, they need then to do differently than what they want to do. So often I say, do what I ask you to do, not what you want to do. And I'm not sure they understand it. So I'm going to spend some time this year helping them understand that. Because if we Good don't... luck. Yeah, well, okay, they're <laughs> 10, 9 and 10. We'll see what happens here. God can work miracles. And that's what I'm going to pray for every day in my classroom before the kids come in. Lord... Give me a miracle today to help these youngsters become more like you. I want to spend just so a moment gentleness. on consideration, though. That, that idea of consideration means that I think, if I'm a considerate person, I think before I act. Well, you act, and you don't most, react. That's an important well, thing, But too. you think before you act. And <clears throat> I, over the consider. course of my life, yes... Over the course of my life, that has been one of the things that every mentor I've had, particularly, (laughs) yeah, Tracy, just shut your mouth and think, and then act, and talk. But it's hard, Uh, because, you know, your head is going at 90 miles an hour, and most days, you know, what pops out of our mouth may be, even as a joke, how many times do I hear, oh, that was just a joke? Bad joke. Well, you know. Well, bad or good, shut your mouth, think, and then speak. Then you don't have to say, oh, that was a bad joke. So it kind of goes to the third trait, which is patience. No, you know, you got to be careful here. Patience is long suffering. Well, not just long suffering, but I love the next part of it being able to bear up under provocation or trials. And then the very last part, focusing. On the value of others. Each one of these, humility, gentleness, and patience, focuses on the value of others. Yeah. It's not all about me. How many times have you you said that to your kids or or you have heard it said to you or for you or about you? It's not all about you. It's not all about me. 
So how do we figure that with today where they say, oh, you got to take care of yourself. You got to focus on on getting to be your best self-care. Oh, my goodness. I struggle a lot. And I do mean a lot with. I am not saying neglect yourself to the point where you're, you know, ill. But I am saying that often we focus and we become um, cyclical in our interdependence, not on Christ, but on ourselves. I can improve myself. I can make things better. I can. I, there are things that I can do that will will make me better. And yes, there are. You know, when you go to school, you do have to do it. But we often exclude what Christ wants to do in us and through us and recognizing that 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 long suffering, that willingness to um, to focus on the value of others, to turn away from self-importance. Yeah, that part is really where we will begin to find the power in our lives and the power of God in our lives and what he wants to do. We all have buttons that can be pushed. And we know the buttons in our siblings, in our parents, in our friends, in people who annoy us. We know we know the buttons. Sometimes. And I tell my Hopefully students. Hopefully as adults we've been able to, yeah. to do that. But I tell my students, just because you know the button doesn't mean you have to push it. It's like a fire alarm. Or is it like it's the, all the buttons on the elevator hitting each one as you go up 38 floors yeah. <laughs> or more if you're downtown L.A. or some huge But building, recognizing but. that not everybody is there, and that's where the long suffering comes in. So the fire alarm, like it says, pull here. You don't have to as you walk by. Exactly. If we can look at the qualities and ask God to be those qualities in us each day. But we have to ask. It's As time goes on, hopefully our character is getting stronger in Christ, but we still have to work at it. And that's where Monday's lesson goes. Together as one in the one. Now, I wish the first one was not capitalized so that we know that the one at the end is talking about Christ, of course. And here is, together as one, are the seven ones that Paul um, um, delineates. I, I couldn't think of the word I want, so we'll go with delineates. It's not the word I want, but we'll go with delineates in chapter 4, verses 4, four. 5, and 6. I don't think four. it goes on to 7. Yeah. Four, five, and six. Oh, no. Go, go ahead. Where the seven ones, and it, it, interestingly enough, um, Dr. McVeigh says that the, Paul takes on a poetic form here, and he's, uh, it apparently is something that is not unknown to the Ephesians, and uses being the ones together, so to speak. There is one body. There's your first one. That's referring, of course, to the church, the body of Christ. There is one spirit. There's one hope of our calling. There's one Lord, one faith. We're at five now. One baptism and one God, Father of all. There are the seven ones. Interesting that there are seven of them. You know, I I wonder all the numbers and how they work, if they are symbolic or if there's really some more to it than that. And that's like question 17,628 that I'll ask Jesus when we get to heaven. Mm-hmm. And if they're calling numbers to talk to Jesus, if you're behind me, it'll be a long wait. But then again, we have eternity, so who cares? <laughs> but in any case, you know, those oneness is what we're being called to do within the church, within the body. And... There's lots of references here from Ephesians, from Colossians, from Galatians, from 1 Timothy that um, Dr. McVeigh puts back into, uh, or cross-references to emphasize the point of that 
yeah. And call I'm, that we have all. It's over all and through all and in all. Galatians one twenty three. Galatians one twenty three. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Um, when we recognize that you read Galatians one twenty three. Yeah, that was one twenty three. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it isn't. No, she read. Sorry, 2.23. Okay, 1.23, here we go. They only heard it said, he who, because I I read on, you know how I am, Um, he who once uh, persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And that, of course, is Paul. So what is that gospel? Recognizing the faith that he had. So then if we go on to Colossians... Um, 123, and I will get the 23 on this one. Um, provided that you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which has been then been preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister recognizing again and going on to first timothy give me a second here first timothy four four verses one and six now give them a chance to get away i know well i have several to get there books too. away but you got yours marked in advance uh, i know so give them a moment or two it's like you know when they say let us kneel for prayer dear heavenly father it's like whoa let us kneel for prayer if you're going to ask us to kneel you know turn to Psalms okay. 118.4, okay. and they start reading. It's like, how can you turn? Anyway, so First I'm Timothy talking 4, here if so you get a chance to get to 1 Timothy yeah. 1. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 6. Now the Spirit expressly says in later times, some depart from the faith by giving heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And then it goes on to say... Don't give in to that because and that's a little bit later verse 6 on. if you put these instructions before the brethren you will be a good minister of Christ nourished of the words of the faith and of the good doctrine which you have followed so looking at that saying be careful of your faith because make sure your faith is aligned with what is good and true don't be misled and we we, we have that a little bit uh, later in the lesson too, yes in, in in the fact that of the the oneness of god the father of all things um and not referring to that but also being careful of the one faith staying true to it that was originally yeah. preached the original gospel of christ mm-hmm. the good news of salvation and remember, Paul is preaching to people who have a plethora of beliefs that come through the um, the city of and the area. I guess you could say it. You know, it's big like L.A. You know, it's a big area. And they're coming in just massive numbers of traders and businessmen and Either a trading a area or was it a port, yeah. a port city? Yeah. Right, a so. hub of, well, yeah. Um, a hub of trade and, and whatever. And when you look at that, the religions that were coming from the East and the West and, you know, pantheism, that that idea, it can be all things to all people. Well, and we'll get to that Which we have a little bit too. of that, too. We'll get to that later. And in, so he's saying, study. be careful. Doing, we need to empower us to return to the hard work of advancing the unity, but with fresh conviction that in doing so, we are accomplishing God's own work. We need to work on that. And that's the difficulty, and that's the second part of this portion of Ephesians 4, that the unity of the church... It's at first a, a spiritual fact that that as Christians we walk in that that way that we're rooted in Christianity and the seven items that Paul delineates here 
are what are needed to for that unity to happen so that we can have that fresh conviction of the Holy Spirit, of God, as we accomplish His work through the church. Now, there's at the bottom of the lesson, there's always that gray-shaded box. Um, in Sunday's lesson, it asked you to think about the attributes of humility, gentleness, and patience, and how it would help to unify us as a people if we focused on those, if we cultivated those virtues. Now, cultivate means you got to work at it. A farmer cultivates his field. That's work. It's serious work. It's not, um, the field looks okay. No, it's, it's, it's a daily job to cultivate the soil. On Monday's lesson, how does it make you feel? How should it make you feel knowing what it says about our unity in and with God through Christ? Those seven statements of unity, how, would, how does that all work together? Well, we got to first look to Christ, and Tuesday's lesson takes us right there, the exalted Christ, giver of gifts. So back to um, Ephesians, they put the quote right, they actually take the scripture and write it out for you. Ephesians um, 4, 7 through 10. However, he has given each of us a spiritual gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scripture says, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice it says he ascended. It clearly means Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. And that's from the New Living Translation. This is the one time Dr. McVeigh uses that versus the English Standard Version. So Tuesday spends, spends time on looking at the ascent and the descent. And we know that when Christ came, it was definitely a descent. You know, from heaven to earth, definitely a descent. But his choice, not not God's going, okay, you got to go. No, I don't want to go. Yeah, you got to go. No, it was it was a willingness to lay aside himself. So Christ, in the act of being born a human, laid aside that, that heavenly part of him and became a human. And it literally stayed set aside. He could have reached out and grabbed it, but he didn't. And when he, after his crucifixion, when he was done, the plan of salvation was done, final, done, done, done. It would be that he would ascend to heaven. And when he left earth then, he took with him some people. So he the descend... And he took people with him. We know in the Bible, I think it's in Romans and in Hebrews both, or Acts also. Um, some people were... Um, it might be in one of the Gospels, too. I don't remember, but I was surprised where it was. Uh, oh, is it, no, that's Acts 2. It's talking about the day of Pentecost. It doesn't yeah. have a scriptural reference in the lesson, but it is in the Bible yeah, as well as in the Spirit of Prophecy that there was... A pretty large group of people who were resurrected at Christ's death. At his when he said it is finished, there was a great earthquake, and that earthquake opened up tombs, and yeah. the righteous, a number of righteous, this is a large number, were brought to life. And the next three days before Christ ascended to heaven, went about Jerusalem proclaiming Christ, uh, Jesus the Messiah, has been crucified and risen, and so forth. Friday. Friday's where that reference is. Um, if Matthew, you, if, there you go. Yeah. I knew it was in the Gospels. Yeah, 27, 51 to 53, looking at the first fruits of the redeemed that he presented to the Father to say, these are, these are... I wonder um, how you got on that list. Because I'm sure there were more than just those people who were truly you know what? redeemed. But in any case, it does I guess matter. that was the gold ticket, uh, the platinum ticket. But, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but... but 
But they as, witnessed. Yes, they witnessed Christ. They had witnessed his life and no resurrection, obviously. Yes, and not perhaps not his life because they may have been dead for eons. Because okay. I do think that that's possible. I do think that it's stated that some of them were of great stature, and obviously people of Jesus' time were not of great stature, except for like you know the well we'll that. we'll but find in any out. Case, in any case, those were the fruit. Those were the ones. Now, what I found very unique about and and Paul here is is using his learned skills in quoting a verse from Psalms. Yes. Uh, Psalm 68, verse 35, the lesson talks about, actually 38, all uh, portions throughout, 1 and 2, 35, um, those are the, uh, eight, verse 18 and so forth, and that he ascends on high and gifts, uh, Tracy read, uh, where is it, and so he, um, I read this out, I don't know where the way, um, he gave gifts to his people. The Ephesians, as all those in the world time in which we're studying now, when they were cap- when they were taken captive, the people who were captive gave gifts to the conquering person. Tribute. Mm-hmm. I find it interesting that Jesus turns the tables and gives gifts to he, the conqueror, gives gifts rather than the conquered giving gifts. Also, if we look at this, recognizing that the descent that happens after Christ's ascension. So, you know, it's God and man, God and man, God and man. That that process goes on when he sends the Holy Spirit. I will send you a comforter. I will send you the Spirit of God and you will do in, if you look at, at John 15, it talks about how I will send you and you will do things greater than I have. I don't know if you've thought about that. Things greater than what Jesus has done? How could it be greater than Jesus? That's pretty amazing. Especially but, when one of the gospel books, I think it's John, ends with... And these are just a few of the things that Jesus did. If we were to write them all down, the world couldn't hold the books. So that's pretty amazing. And that's the promise. We don't, we don't even take hold of a small smidgen. That's a small enough amount. A smidgen of what God is willing to give us. You know, he has... The power of the universe. And do we ask for that? Well, no, mostly because we're scared um, to think, uh, what if he gives me more power and then I have to do more? <laughs> um, that sometimes is what holds us back. And so when we look at, um, as we move on to Wednesday, this is really what we want to look at. Here are the gifts of the exalted Jesus. This is what Jesus, the gifts that are given to unify us to have truly have unity within the church. So we have apostles. Uh, today our church doesn't do much with apostles. Well, a, a po- the word, if I remember earlier in this study or earlier period Missionaries. as we've been doing this, it was um, an apostle is someone who is sent out. Mm-hmm. to give a message. message. So we do have apostles. Okay. Today. We just don't call them apostles. Yeah. And prophets. Mm. We are very careful about prophets. Um, Ellen White did not call herself a prophet. She, in fact, made... Um, it very clear it that very she was clear. not a prophet. But what's prophetess. interesting is that in her messages... She did carry um, a measure of prof- prophetic um, information. Now, here is what's... And that's where she differentiated um, for herself. I am not a prophet. Well, and, you know, as you look at how apparently the word prophet is used by Paul here, she was. Because in the Amplified Version, after it says, and some prophets... Inspired preachers and expounders. She did both. 
She expounded on the Bible, not equal with the Bible, but gave more information and insights through the Conflict of the Ages series. And she certainly was an inspired preacher, but there are many inspired preachers today. I think of Chuck Swindoll off the top of my head. I think of Alistair Begg. Um, those are the ones that I am familiar with. And I think in his time, I think Robert Schuler was too. Now, as he advanced, um, things might have uh, changed, but I think in his uh, ministry, he... <laughs> well, I made it last week without sneezing and didn't this week. <sighs> okay. Boy, I tell so you. So I so put the people... Jump in here. <clears throat> I put the people who um, <clears throat> Tom was talking about more... Um, in line with evangelists. Well, but an evangelist and, is a preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries. Okay, and I I agree with that. <laughs> um, as we look at, and then of course the shepherds, the the pastors, and teachers. and the teachers. When we look at this, um, pastors and teachers are the same group. Um, it's interesting oh, I, to me. I have a little flock that I shepherd. I would consider that my little my little cherubs at school. Sometimes they're more uh, uh, banshees than cherubs, but nevertheless, it's a little group that I do. Well, and when we recognize sure. that the that the job of um, a pastor and a teacher is the same. Now you know a teacher is there five or six days a week, depending on how involved they are in the church. But um, many of them will spend more time than parents, more time than pastor, with kids, guiding them, shepherding them along the way. And I think the structure of that looks at how important it is that the church and school that Adventists have become a single unified front. I believe that is truly, you know, it, Eagle Rock has always held education and having our children in Adventist schools as a mission from the church and the school. And I know, I I was blessed to be in Adventist schools. I My parents did not have a lot. We spent a whole lot of time, um, how shall I say, a lot of our income went to school. And um, by the time I was in fourth or fifth grade, I was expected to pick berries, to um, do crop different crops that we could pick and earn money. Um, I went out and cut wood so that I could pay my entrance fee. That was my job every year. And as I went through high school and college, you know, that was my job in the summer. Make sure that you have your entrance fee, at least. Now, you need to Think for a moment, if you know anything about Tracy's family, well, I'm not sharing too much here. She has two sisters, one older, one younger. And at one point in time, all three of those girls were at Walla Walla University together. Yeah. Think about that expense. It's a lot. It was a lot. And I, I think about my parents and, you know, they paid 12 months. <laughs> um, paying for education was not a... You know, oh, well, we've got a couple months to kind of recoup. Um, it was very much. And my parents, it was the the first thing. I mean, tithe and then school. And then we made sure that we covered it however we covered. And I think about that today. And I know that the dedication of my parents helped make me who I was and who I have become as an adult. And I believe that having people... Now, I've had good and bad teachers. I've had... How about poor teachers, poor not bad teachers. teachers? Yeah, that's true. Because, you know, when you say bad teachers, you think someone who actually maybe abuses children or yeah, something. Yeah, but I've had poor teachers, and I've had good teachers. But that's not the point of Christian education. 
Christian education is how someone who has the end goal in mind that I do, and that is my child in heaven. And I know as parents, you know, we all hope our kids make it there. We all pray that God will guide our children in the way um, they should go. But recognizing that more people with that end goal in mind, not just raising a good kid, not just raising, and that's kind of where Paul is. He's like, it's not just having you be part of the church. It's being unified for one goal. For one goal. And that's heaven. And those individuals who are gifted in being an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, shepherds and teachers are to build up the body of Christ, to build up the church, working all together in unity so that they can truly have the measure that God the Son is in his fullness yeah. as Christ, yeah. the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one to whom we all serve, really, if you're Christian. And that word, again, means Christ-like. Christ-centered, yeah. I, you know, I was thinking our, our first babysitter um, was a Catholic lady, very devoted. Um, very devout, to, too. Yeah. And, um, you know, her son died, and, and Elizabeth said to her, uh, after Mackenzie yeah, after, had died. Well, Mackenzie had died before. Oh, that's but, true, of course. But um, her son died, and she said, oh, my son is an angel, you know, with your little brother. And and Elizabeth goes, well, yeah. Um, Elizabeth, no, that is not true. <laughs> Here my she is brother, at, like, four years of age, right? Yeah, my brother <laughs> is dead. He's in Forest Lawn, and when Jesus comes, um, he will go, and we're going to have dinner. <laughs> and, you know, for her, that was straight up gospel. And it's interesting because I've often thought about what if my child was influenced? Little kids, they pick up on so much and it becomes gospel. You know, Tom experiences that often when parents say, ah, the kid goes, uh uh-uh, uh, Mr. Harder says, um, that kind of thing. And I, I think about that. But Elizabeth was so firm. In fact, Carmen said to me, wow, um, I don't know what you believe. And so I explained a little bit about our our view, biblical view of the state of the dead. And, and that, you know, for us, they're just asleep until Jesus comes back. And she just listened. I don't know, you know, who knows. But I think about, I want people... In my, in my mentorship of my children, and I want to be that way, where I'm representing the truth of the Bible. I don't want just good people. I want people who have that, that heart and that purpose who are going to bring my kids. And I feel that way about church workers, too. It's so important for us to say, oh, you know, we won't, we won't quibble about I'm not saying become didactic and nasty about it. What I am saying is to reiterate the purpose and truth of Jesus Christ that can unite us in that one faith, one God, one one single idea of the Bible. And of course, the people that Paul was speaking about in these cases were the church leaders. And the lay leaders. The lay, lay leaders, leaders, because yeah. they, did not, they did not have a ministry, of course, back then like we have today. Yeah. Or a, not a ministry, but... A, Hierarchy of, of church well, I, structure. Yeah, sure. And so th- we need to, of course, be careful how we choose our leaders. Yeah. Because it is so critical to the unity of the body of Christ. Yeah. So and Thursday's we, lesson... Oh, And we know that a, in the past that there have been times where our church hasn't been very unified. So we're going to move on here to Thursday quickly. Um and Growing look at, up in Christ. Um, Christ verse rather. 14. Ephesians 4, we're back in Ephesians now. Ephesians 4, 14. 
And Paul starts out by saying, so then... So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the cunning men and their craftiness in deceitful wiles. And I want to read 15 and 16 because we're going to do that a little, in just a little minute. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. Uh, if you get the Pacific Union Recorder, which you should if you're a member of a baptized member of any church within the Union, you and have gone through the pages, you notice that in the first quarter of this year, in our union, we have an additional 365 new members through baptism, which has been the first growth in quite a number of years um, from one quarter to the next to have that many. And also a substantial increase in tithes so far this year. And I, when I say substantial, almost 12.5% over this same period last year. So that growing up is so important that we understand that's way those are ways in which we can personally contribute on a financial basis supporting the, the unity of the church having being no longer children and being careful to as to what is being put before us in various forms not at church per se but if there's you know diversity going on and I don't mean diversity as in different people groups, but diversity as in the message, diversity as into what's being said and taught or what's being put forward there. You know, the danger of the high seas tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. You know, our doctrine is pretty set, but perhaps in earlier Adventism it wasn't so much so. Well, they were constantly, and as new people come in, sometimes those ideas come in and, <clears throat> and people say, oh, we need to be accepting. Well, I, we all struggle, and I'm going to put myself in the middle of this. We all struggle with being accepting of people like Christ was, but not allowing for a change of what we know to be true. To love people and yet not necessarily approve every new idea that comes in. And that is that is the one thing that I was talking about before. I, I was looking at the number of teachers and principals who have come in to serve the church, who have become, as adults, Adventists, and they they don't have the, the um, how do I say? Depth of the experience. The depth of experience and understanding of the Bible, because they're new, and how easily they can be pulled away, and it becomes a very divisive thing. And recognizing that as, as workers, as members of the church, our job is to, to help encourage and teach and share the good news not just of Jesus, not just of Jesus, but of what the Bible is bringing into play in this whole message. And I was looking at the end of the of the lesson. Before you get to the very end of Thursday, um, I want to touch on the very last part of the first half of Thursday's lesson, which um, Dr. McVeigh writes, Paul believes divisiveness to be an important mark of Error. Hmm. Hmm. It will deplete and divide. And that's what Satan is so clever at. He's just at the edge. Just at the edge. You know, making it By their fruits you'll know them. That's right. You know, study all things, prove all things. By your fruits you'll know them. So that... <clears throat> Our goal <clears throat> is to have trusted teachers <clears throat> who will foster unity 
who'll bring together the active parts of the body. And that's our job. That's all of our job. That's not just the Sabbath school teachers. That's not just the pastor or the elder. That's all of us actively coming together to discuss. That's the part of that I'm, uh, as I watch the adult Sabbath school class, you know, we've grown to anywhere between 25 and 35 people, a um, very large class. But as people have come back together, that ability to discuss and share and, and put out and, and go over, you know, and get perspective, but also recognizing that we can come together as one is so important. That is, that is a huge part of our ministry today. So as we look at the end, um, these, like ligaments, tendons, and every joint, which we all know as we age, um, have a unifying function, help us grow up together in Christ, who is the head. And that's the part of being part of the body that we want to recognize today. We all have a job, so to speak, to do. Let us, let's pray this week that we can have clarity through the Holy Spirit to know what that job is and then be empowered to have the courage to fulfill and it. Yeah. Dear Jesus, we thank you for providing for this lesson that we can better understand as time grows short here how we can be one and present to the world your true final message that we may hasten your second coming. Amen that we can go home to heaven and you can show the heavenly angels the fruits, the latter fruits of your labors, your life, the plan of salvation, and we can live eternally with you. Amen. May this week be a week of blessing to others as we practice being humble, gentle, and patient. Give us these strengths and powers, and Lord, May we truly be thinking of others first. These things I ask in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Have a good week.